Welcome to a CNBC Africa panel special. And today's conversation is going to focus on illicit financial flows. Why so? Now, uh, this is something uh, that is quite compelling. We've been talking about capital flight leaving uh, the continent, but uh, it is also having a great impact on the economic recovery uh, of the African continent, especially after the worst rece recent recession in modern times. Now, a little bit of context for the conversation. Uh, statistics from the United Nations reveal that illegal uh, financial flows contribute to 88.6 billion US dollars of capital flight per year from the continent. Now, reducing these outflows can increase the stock of capital available for Africa's economic recovery. Now, to break this down for us, we're joined by a panel of experts. I'll start with Nancy Abisa. She is a lawyer uh, with the East African Legislative Assembly. We're also joined by Mr. Don Dea, the CEO of Pan Africa. Lawyers Union and Mrs. Shenai Mukumba. Uh, she's the policy research and advocacy manager at Tax Justice Network for Africa, also known as TGNA. And I would like to start with Shenai uh, to you know break down this conversation. 88.6 billion US dollars is uh, the sum that the United Nations are putting uh, on IFS. But uh, how big of a problem uh, is this uh, that uh, is faced by Africa when it comes to the illicit financial flows? Thanks so much, Arnold. That's, that's such a great question, because often when we talk about these numbers, it's really difficult to put it into context. So, so let, me, let me try to do that. So when we talk about the continent losing $88.6 billion, it's, it's a huge number, but what does that mean on the ground? So first and foremost, we have um, a deficit of about $200 billion. That's essentially how much money that we need as a continent to help us achieve our sustainable development goals. $88.6 billion, the amount of money we're losing on an annual basis, is half of that. So if we were able to maintain and keep within our continent's borders those resources, we would already have been able to finance half of our needs in order to achieve our SDGs. And, and to maybe put it in more context, we receive just over $40 billion um, in, in overseas development assistance. We receive just over 50 in, in foreign direct investment, right? Basically, we are losing on an annual basis almost double the amount of money that we receive um, almost as gifts from other countries, right? When you're talking about overseas development assistance, we are losing almost double the amount of money that we are receiving in terms of foreign direct investment. So basically, that amount of money that we're losing speaks to the fact that a lot of the resources that we are losing as a continent, if we were able to keep within our own borders, essentially could contribute to us being self-sufficient in achieving our own sustainable development goals. And so this is tackling poverty, providing education, healthcare assistance for our own people, um, creating an environment that's necessary for our own businesses to thrive. All of that is possible for us to finance for ourselves, but because we're losing this money, we end up being dependent on external actors. And so that's what that $88.6 billion means in context. Uh, quite the breakdown. And also I want you to bring you into the conversation. Uh, and here I want you to give us a little bit of context regarding uh, the East African community. When you look at things like YALA, the East African Legislative Assembly, uh, uh, it's also not one organization that are uh, uh, many people in East Africa feel like it's doing enough when it comes to situations like this. Now, these um, 88.6 billion US dollars, about 3.7% of Africa's GDP. Uh, when you look at East Africa's GDP, about you know 42% of that. Uh, how, how, how do you tackle such a challenge? Okay, first I'd like to say um, thank you very much and thank you for having me uh, on this panel um, to discuss this important topic. One of the things that I can tell you is that unfortunately, uh, not many East Africans understand how the East Africa Legislative Assembly works. And then number two, uh, it's been uh, very difficult uh, to uh, bring uh, quite a number of issues uh, to work because don't forget that this is an, as an assembly that has a lot of geopolitics in terms of how it is structured. Now, uh, having said that, you need to understand that um, the whole um, architecture 
around uh, collection of, of taxes is on indirect taxes. And the more we understand that, the more we will get to know that then it is important for us to be able to know how do we deal with what is going on. Now, how countries deal, uh, partner states, different partner states deal with the IFFs and even revenue collection is at a different stage and at a different level. And uh, at the ESC, there was uh, the ESC protocol on preventing and combating corruption and also a task force on financial act action uh, and money laundering. Now, that has not even seen the light of day because of the different complexities that we have within partner states. All partner states would like to address this at their own level in their own way. And that's what makes it very difficult to uh, probably even when it comes out to figures, be able to um, uh, look at it from a regional perspective. So at the region, yes, we are a region, but then we still are doing things at country perspective. It is clear that at the regional level, laws that are passed at the regional level are automatically supposed to be domesticated at the country level. But unfortunately, that is not easy because before a law is considered, before a bill is actually assented to and considered a law, it has to be assented to by all the now six presidents. Next year we're going to have seven presidents. So it makes it very difficult to uh, actually be able to uh, find things moving. Uh, Don, I know, will tell you this because um, if, if you are within the region, you understand the complexities of which partner states work in. And so you find that even in terms of um, revenue collection, in terms of figures, and in terms of the various visions that the partner states have, they all have different visions, a different level, a different collection, and a different charts. That makes it difficult for us to say this is the position of EAC. It is actually a position of partner states. So we are still working at it, and I'm thinking that we are going to get there so that we can be able now to look at how to address some of these issues collectively. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, Don, uh, bringing to the conversation, Nancy says, you know, uh, there are individual uh, ways uh, countries are trying to tackle. It's not very unified. Uh, uh, what do you think could be done, you know, to combat uh, the illicit financial flows? Okay. And it's very good, I think, that uh, Honorable Nancy Abisai has taken the time to lay out practically uh, what some of the challenges are when you're working with multiple uh, states so that we know them. The thing with the illicit financial flows, IFFs, is that they're deliberately designed by the powerful in the world. The powerful nations back their big businesses to then be able to operate across the world, especially in the global south, in ways in which they are taking away from us much more than they're giving us. As Chennai has uh, demonstrated, even what you call foreign direct investment, which would come from these multinationals, uh, they're taking away double what they're putting in. So it's a net loss for us. Even if you say ODA, the official development assistance, which many times of course comes with the conditionalities that then open up our markets. Uh, we're giving out twice what we're receiving. So Africa is really a net donor, not a net recipient. Now, tackling the international financial architecture, the powerful that make these rules, the G7, the G8, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, is not a thing that any single African country can do on its own, even those relatively powerful financially like Nigeria, like South Africa, they can't. There's no single state in the global South that's powerful enough to do it on its own. So to cause real change, we actually really need to band together. Otherwise, they'll pit us off against each other, which is what is happening. And that's part of what Honorable Nancy Abisa is describing, where you're now in a race to the bottom to try and attract this so-called mythical FDI you give some incentives. Then your sister states looks at the incentives you've given and they give even more incentives. 
Then the other sister state looks at it and they give even more incentives. So it's a race to the bottom where in the end, the African is getting nothing. So we've got to bank together. The goodness is though we are facing challenges with the regional economic communities, there is a continental standard. Uh, eight years ago, the AU appointed a high level panel chaired by respected former South African president, Tabo Mbeki, uh, which was called the High Level Panel on Illicit Financial Flows from Africa. In January of 2015, it presented its detailed report to the AU Summit, which the AU Summit um, adopted by way of a special assembly declaration. And it set out there the measures that we need to do to combat illicit financial flows from Africa, from having stronger laws, especially around financial management, from having stronger institutions, stronger revenue authorities, stronger financial intelligence units, more interagency collaboration, especially to be able to assess for the big multinationals that they're paying their fair share of tax, and especially the multinationals in the extractive industry and so on. So the measures have been put uh, there, or at least the recommendations have been put and a policy decision has been made. So this is what we're using when we're going around talking to the regional economic communities, talking to the countries, telling them the AU has already adopted a policy, please be implementing it. Thank you. Uh, Chennai, I want to bring you back into the conversation. Uh, this is a topic uh, or something that you deal with on a daily, and I want you to break this down uh, for our viewers uh, on how these uh, financial outflows happen. H how do they occur? That's that's a really great question. So, I mean, they happen in a, in a number of different ways. Um, so, first of all, there's 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 three different types, right? So there's, there's commercial outflows. And so this is when we have multinational corporations that are either illegally um, finding ways of, of getting money out of the country or um, engaging in, in aggressive tax planning um, to, to, to get resources to leave the continent. And, and, and this type of commercial illicit financial flow accounts for about 65% of the, of the resources that are leaving our continent. So when you think about that, that, that 80 8.6 billion dollars that's leaving the continent you need to know that that almost two-thirds um, of that is is perpetuated by multinational corporations and 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 specific to 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 the african continent you tend to find that it's, it's it tends to be multinational corporations that are engaging in the extractive sector right that, that are actually contributing the, the most significant amount to these illicit financial flows that are as a result of, of of sort of commercial operations and so when we talk about iffs like i mentioned there's three but this for us is the most significant um way in which we're losing money that we we work towards advocating we address those issues. Um, the, the second and, and third um, account for a, a, a lot less, but you know, are still significant. Um, and so this is, for example, um, illegal ways through like drug trafficking, um, uh, human trafficking, like like really illegal ways um, that that are being engaged in by by various actors within our society um, that are resulting in money flowing out of the out of the the, the continent. Um, and then the third way that we that we have um, that that contributes to illicit financial flows is through corruption, right? Um, and so this is often when you tend to find politically exposed people or elites um, engaging in corrupt behavior, contributing to money leaving our continent. Um, corruption, though, and and this is really important for me to note when you take a look at um, the, the breakdown of illicit financial flows only accounts for about 5%. And one of the things that was really important, um, just to make reference to the report that uh, Don spoke to, is that often, in fact, not even often now and, and in the past, when you talk about illicit financial flows, when you talk about Africa not having sufficient resources to, to fund its own development, before the, the high-level panel report, it was often uh, politicians that were pointed to Africa's almost inherent corrupt nature that was pointed to as the reason why we didn't have the resources to fund our own development. But like I mentioned, this report revealed that 65% of the money that's leaving the continent is as a result of multinational corporations. And, and so essentially, this needs to be a very, um, this is a key area that we should be focusing on when we're looking at this conversation of IFFs. So, so, so yeah, I think just to respond to your question, those are the three ways we have illicit financial flows coming out of the continent, but the most significant is the contribution that multinational corporations, enterprises, particularly those in the extractive sector, um, are contributing to this, this larger um, outflow of resources. Thanks, Arnold. 
Uh, uh, bringing uh, Nancy uh, into the uh, back into the conversation, uh, as a lawyer, a member of uh, the East African Legislative Assembly, uh, a simple stat there says we could gain, we is Africa, could gain about 89 billion US dollars annually by curbing uh, these ifs. Um, how and what can we put in place to ensure mm -hmm. that uh, that 89 billion US dollars stays on the continent? <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. That's a very good question. One of the things, and I keep saying this, I've said it before and I'll keep repeating it. Let me tell you something. We need to accept that fight, fighting IFFs is a political issue. It's a political question. It's, it requires political goodwill. Some of the agreements and some of the, um, um, the, 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 the agreements and some of the, 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 the issues and statements that are, 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 are given uh, and are sent to by countries, sometimes they don't even pass through parliament. Parliament does not even ratify them. It just goes straight into implementation and it is actualized. Now, that is where we have to start from. You need to understand that, for me, I think that the political impact of IFF within the African continent is something that, yes, we can push aside, but that's where everything lies. When you talk about multinationals and all the 60% that uh, they, 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 they are taking out of this continent, we are talking about our, um, our, our natural resources, many countries having go very, a lot of natural resources. Let me stick to the region. Let's talk about Tanzania. And let's talk about DRC that is going to join the region. Look at the natural resources. Uh, you know that um, a while back, and I know maybe this could be a little controversial, but you do know that um, the former president, uh, before he died, he had put into place uh, very, very, um, uh, very good uh, mechanisms to try and and stop um, uh, some of these money laundering um, activities in the country. And uh, it wasn't taken very kindly. It, he was being fought by his own people. And even within the region, some people thought that it is a dictatorial way of doing things. But sometimes you have to take uh, difficult steps if you have to make anything work. And for me, regional cooperation is critical in, 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 in being able to fight corruption, fighting money laundering. Because the core question of whether it is possible for us to deal with the issue is, 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 is actually um, uh, uh, geared and wired around what kind of political goodwill that we have. I know you wonder why are we putting this in. I'll tell you, like we had uh, the ESC protocol on preventing and combating corruption. Then we had the task force. And this task force is also on um, money laundering and uh, IFFs. Why hasn't it taken off to the extent that we want it to take off? It's because it doesn't have goodwill from all partner states. Why doesn't it have goodwill from all partner states? Because of different interests. And that's why I kept on telling you that the issue of geopolitics then comes in. And that's why even when we talk about figures, when we talk about, of course, we do have gains that we have made. We talk about gains, we talk about figures, we talk about processes, but we need to get some things right because ultimately we need to talk about prevention and then we have to look about financial investigation and, and recovery. That's the only way that you get to know that something is happening and that even as this money, 60% is going out, we're not going to be a house of lamentations all the time and talking about what could have been done. We need to look at moving forward, what needs to be done? What is the best way to tackle? Because we, we know the problem. We know everything. Africans, even the ordinary citizen, now can tell you the, the problem of IFFs and how it is affecting. A rising continent full of inequality, poverty, what is the problem? We know what is affecting us, but we need to find solutions. What are the solutions? We need to get our architecture around this um, even domestic resource mobilization, tax collection, and revenue expenditure. We need to get it right. If we don't get it right, that's how we, we, we keep on going back now, to the now same see, thing. Unfortunately, I have to yeah. cut you short because we are running out of time. I, wa I want Don to give us his closing 
remarks there. Uh, Don, what's the way forward? I think the way forward is how strongly African citizens can demand for action from their governments. The roadmap exists. Uh, we know the loopholes that need to be closed in our company's laws, in our tax laws, uh, in our mining uh, development laws, and so on, and in the process, uh, processes that follow. And then we want the money that's been looted to be brought back, asset recovery. At the beginning of last year, just before COVID, again, the African Union passed the Common African Position on Asset Recovery and Return. With the help of colleagues such as yourself from the media and especially investigative journalism, we've learned now where our money is with the Pandora's Papers. We learned before with the Panama Papers, Lax Leaks, and so on. So a strong demand then is how we, the people, will use courts, will use parliaments, will use the streets to get the money back. Thank you, Don. And Chennai, uh, in your closing remarks, uh, I, I'm giving exactly 40 seconds. Uh, is tax justice a possibility? Absolutely. I mean, we, we wouldn't be doing the work we do if we didn't think it was a possibility. It has to be a possibility. <laughs> um, and, and, and the reason we believe it's a possibility is because we see it as one of the key ways um, key ways in which we're going to use to address the, the inequalities, the deficiencies that we see on our continent. Um, and if we are able to achieve tax justice, one of the things that we will see is Africa taking back its sovereignty to be able to take control um, of its future, of its destiny, and, and, and essentially be the one responsible for achieving its own sustainable development um, achievement. Thank you very much there, Shenai. Uh, definitely, with this conversation with the Tax Justice Network for Africa has just started. A uh, lot of things to tackle there. Uh, today's conversation, though, was on IFS, uh, something you all know as illicit financial flows. It's a conversation that could have gone on the whole day, but unfortunately, I have to bring it to an end. Now, if you want to comment on any of the things we talked about today here, tweet us at CNBC Africa or tag me directly at The Real Quiz. And I want to thank our panel of experts, uh, starting with Honorable Nancy Abisa uh, from the East Africa Legislative Assembly, Don Dea, the CEO of Pan-African Lawyers Union, and Chennai Mukumba, Policy Research and Advocacy Manager at the Tax Justice Network for Africa, also known as TGNA. As always, have a great rest of your day. <laughs>